Good morning and happy Sabbath. Have you enjoyed the music this morning? Thank you so much, Dulce and the Keen Children's Choir. It's so wonderful to have you guys. David, you guys are good. Daniel, my bad, my bad. Ah, today is an exciting day, and it's such a privilege to be with you guys this morning here in the house of the Lord. Amen? We get to worship together um, in song and music and giving and in the word. Um, and I have to say, I cannot believe um, that this day has come. It seems like just yesterday um, that I was just starting here as a student pastor two years ago, um, and you guys welcomed me with open arms, um, accepted me, and I've been so blessed to be able to serve here um, in the Keene community as a student pastor here and finish up my um, undergraduate degree here at Southwestern Adventist University. Um, and it's exciting times. Um, I get to graduate tomorrow uh, with my uh, Bachelor of Arts in Theology, which, whew, it's been fun. It's been good. And the even better part about it, I get to graduate with my fiance. So, amen. Come to Southwestern. <laughs> and then the even better part, we get to get married this summer, and then we'll be moving to Michigan um, in August. Texas Conference has hired me, and they decided to send me on to seminary. So we're going to be going up there for a couple of years, and then hopefully coming back somewhere around here, maybe close to home, who knows. But my parents are still going to be living here, so we'll definitely be back to visit. But I just want to thank each and every one of you um, for the opportunity that you've given me to be here in Keene and to learn ministry, to minister, and to just be here worshiping with you this morning. Such a pleasure and an opportunity. I invite you this morning to turn to Exodus chapter 14. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 14 this morning, and I'll give you a moment to turn there. This, this text has become so valuable to me during the course of my college career. And I've, as I've made very big life decisions, this text has, has challenged me and helped me to grow. Exodus chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. The title of my message this morning is Go Forward. Bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us here today. And as we dive into your word, I pray that you send your Holy Spirit into this place, that we might be able to test and approve your will and receive a blessing today that we might share with someone else. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. I remember when I was younger. Thanks. I remember when I was younger, we were living in Abilene, Texas, and I was about, I don't know, six or seven years old, something like that. 
And, and we, I, I had been rummaging through the garage, and I had found this package that was about this big, kind of about this big around. It was gray, and it was uh, this kind of nylon texture, and it had a drawstring on top. And I opened that up, and I looked inside, and I, I began to pull out this, this pole that was kind of connected to another pole that was connected to another pole. And I kind of dug down and deeper, and I found this big canvas and some more poles. And I had found myself a two-person tent. And I was super excited about this. For a six- or seven-year-old, this tent was the perfect size. And I remember being so excited about it that I ran to my mom and I said, Mom, can I set this up in the living room and have a camp out tonight in the living room? She said, sure, go ahead, go ahead. And so I got to set up my tent. She helped me out. We got it all set up. And I got inside, and I remember thinking it was the coolest thing ever to be camping in my living room. And thinking back to that time, I think now that if I had tried to go camping for real, that I would be very, very underprepared. I had a tent that was inside, so no weather, no bugs, air conditioning in the middle of summer, it would have been great. But if I had thought that that's what my camping experience would be as I headed out into the wilderness, I would have been very sorely disappointed. And I imagine that the children of Israel were like me at this time in Exodus 14. You see, they've been living in Egypt in the land of Goshen. They'd had a roof over their head. Yes, they'd had to work hard. They were in slavery for 400 years under the Egyptian pharaoh. But they had food to eat, a place to sleep, clothes on their back. And I can imagine as Moses came to them and started to talk about an exodus, to talk about leaving Egypt, getting out of slavery. I can imagine that they were as excited as I was as I opened up that drawstring bag and began to pull out my two-person tent, the little six- or seven-year-old me. But as they got out into the wilderness, I can imagine that they got more than what they bargained for. They're out in the middle of the wilderness, they've left town, they've seen the firework display that Moses, through the help of God, had brought onto the Egyptian people. And they're out in the middle of nowhere with tents and animals and children and babies, not having a clue what to do. And all of a sudden, behind them, they see their captors chasing after them. Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. You'd see, they had gotten their Coleman lanterns out. They had the fireplaces set. They were about to sing the camp songs and put the kids to bed. And the cry went up from the far side of the camp. The Egyptians are coming. The Egyptians are coming. And I can imagine that this news spread through the camp like wildfire. They were afraid. They had gotten out of Egypt. They were safe now, or so they thought. And they cried out to the Lord. You know, it's interesting, looking at these Israelite people, how quickly their faith turned to fear. You see, it wasn't two verses earlier, verse 8 of chapter 14 in Exodus, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out, what? Boldly. They went out of Egypt with their hands held high. Has your team ever won the Super Bowl or the World Series? Hands go up. In the air, that Hebrew word used there boldly literally means hands raised high in victory. You see, they had won the Super Bowl, they won the World Series, they're coming out, and in verse 10 and verse 11, they looked and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very afraid. How quickly their faith turned to fear. As long as they had been focusing 
on God, they had nothing to fear. You see, the one that led them out of Egypt is found in Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 says, The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. And he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. You see, God had been leading the children of Israel. As they had been looking to God, as they had been keeping their focus on God, they had nothing to fear. They had complete faith and trust in their Savior and their provider, the Lord that had brought them out of miserable slavery. But somehow in the midst of it all, as they were following that pillar of cloud by day and that pillar of fire by night, they were looking at that, they were letting that lead, and all of a sudden, they looked the other way. They missed their focus. They took their eye off the ball. And you know, it's kind of strange to me that the children of Israel would do this. They had seen the plagues that had struck Egypt, and they'd seen the miracles that God had been working in their lives. And yet they took their focus off of God. How courageously they had walked out of Egypt with hands held high, singing praises to their Lord and Savior. And how quickly they turned 180 degrees and were completely afraid. It's so strange to me. You see, when their faith moved to fear, in fear they missed their focus. And what caused their faith to turn? They took their eyes off of God. They turned the other way. Their source of their faith they looked away from and were worried about their problems behind them. Instead of looking at God, they looked at their problem. Instead of looking at God, they looked at their past. Church family, how many times do we focus on our problems or our past instead of focusing on the God who is with us through it all and who is bigger than our problems and more timeless than our past? They questioned God. And it makes me think of the game of golf, for those of you that have played. When you get ready to swing the ball, if you're looking where you want to put the ball, you'll miss that little white ball by a mile. But if, some of you have done that, I'm sure I heard the laugh. (laughs) But if you keep your focus where your focus needs to be on the ball and you take that swing and then look, your ball will sail to the green and hopefully make a hole in one as long as it's not a par five. The point is we have to keep our eye on the ball, we have to keep our eyes on God. And seeing this Egyptian advance, the Israelites first cried to God and got no answer. The end of verse 10, the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, period. And almost in that same breath, not waiting for an answer, They said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Pastor James likes to talk a lot about sarcasm used in the Bible, and I think this is an excellent example of how sarcasm is used in the Bible. You know, sometimes we read over the Bible and and it's just kind of like, oh yeah, they said that, cool, we're going to go on to the next thing. But if you think about it, the, the, the Egyptian culture was centered around death and around dying. And the pharaohs tasked their slaves with building these enormous pyramids and burial grounds for themselves and their families. There were thousands, if not millions, of graves in the land of Egypt. And the children of Israel speak to Moses and say, (laughs) what, were there not enough graves back there? Like, come on. You brought us out here to die instead of just leaving us alone? Like, why in this moment? Why here and why now have you brought us to this place. Didn't we tell you, Moses? Didn't we tell you to just leave us 
alone? Verse 12, is it not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And I'm sure they're thinking at that point, at least we would have our lives, even if they're not so great. This isn't what we wanted, Moses. This isn't at all. Who are you to lead us to this place? And I think the words that they spoke to Moses were also the words that they spoke to God. In this moment of fear, in their missed focused fear, they're crying out to the Lord saying, God, why on earth have you brought us here? There's no way that you can provide for us at all. And as I was reading through this text, I began to scratch my head as to the Israelites' response. After they had seen the 10 miracles that God had provided for their exodus, as they had seen how they left Egypt with no one stopping them at all, they would begin to question who God is and what God had been doing for them. I like to think about it in this way. Each and every one of you this morning acted in an incredible feat of faith, and you may not have known it. Think about the common chair that we might sit on daily. There's probably thousands of chairs that you've sat upon. But as you go to sit down on the chair, do you, do you test the structural integrity of the chair? Do you, do you look for rips in the upholstery that might make the comfort a little less comforting? Do you, do you make sure that, that all the, the nails and the screws are in the right place, that it could hold you? Kind of give it, give it a shake or maybe ask somebody else to sit on it before you sit down? Did you do that this morning when you came to sit in your pew? No, right? You come on in, you say, oh man, this is my chair, we're gonna plop right down with complete faith. Complete and utter faith that that chair will hold you whether you've sat on it before or not. And the same applies to our walk with Christ, if not more. Each and every one of you in this room this morning, myself included, can think of the countless ways that God has provided in our lives. Amen? You're here this morning, you're awake and alive. Amen? God has provided for you to be here in this point. And yet we, like the Israelites, even though we've seen how God has led in the past, even though we've seen the countless miracles, we go up to God and say, are you, are you sure, God, that you're gonna hold me? Are, are you sure that these legs are strong enough to support me? Are you sure that you can provide for me no matter what I do? How many times have we done that to God? It boggles my mind why we do that. We serve a God who is immeasurable beyond belief, who owns a cattle on a thousand hills and paves his streets with gold. Praise the Lord if the streets of Keene were paved that way, it wouldn't be so bumpy. God can provide for you in ways that are beyond your imagination, beyond your belief. And yet when it comes to those tough times, when we're looking at our problems and we're looking at our past, we take our focus off of God. In fear, we miss our focus and we turn around and we say, there's no way, God, that you can defeat this giant. And we miss the opportunity for God to work in our lives. In this moment, Moses stands up and encourages his people. Amen for those people in our lives that motivate us and our spiritual leaders. They do amazing things for us in our time of need. And Moses stands up to the people. In verse 13, Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. 
the Lord will fight for you. All you have to do is keep silent. Moses recognized that the children of Israel had an eye problem. Long before there were glasses or ophthalmologists, Moses may have been the first ophthalmologist, seeing that the children of Israel, their eyes were not properly aligned. He said, you're looking in the, at the wrong thing. You keep looking at how you're going to fail instead of looking at how you will succeed with God's help. He says, you're looking at how you can't do it instead of looking at how you can do it with God's help. He says, you're looking for how your problem is bigger than your God than looking for how your problem pales in comparison to the omnipotent God that we serve. He says, just wait. Keep watching. He says, you're looking in the wrong direction. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Keep looking in the right direction and you will not fail. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. When you look at God, you see how your problems disappear completely. There's not a problem in the world that can stand in the way of God. Amen? No problem can stand in the way of God. And it's amazing to see how Moses delivers this speech with all that he can muster. He's got complete faith in God, but in his moment before the people, he still continues to pray for them and pray to God for a miracle. In his heart, he's still praying, and his prayer is not recorded in Exodus. It falls between verse 14 and verse 15. After he tells the people to keep silent, he too keeps silent, but in that moment offers a prayer to God, and God responds to him. He says, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. And as their faith had turned to fear, and in fear they were misfocused, God was about to turn their backward fear into forward momentum. He tells the sons of Israel to go forward. Now think about this for a moment. The children of Israel have left Exodus, and God has directed to go to, for them to go by the way of the south. Instead of taking them by the way of the north through the land of the Philistines, he didn't want to, them to see war, for he knew that they would turn around and go back. He takes them by way of the south, dead smack right up to the Red Sea. And they're sandwiched up against the Red Sea. There's a mountain to their north, and the Egyptian army is coming around from behind. And God tells them to go forward. Have you gone out to the duck pond recently and tried to walk across it? The children of Israel were thinking the same thing that you just thought. They're sandwiched between this enormous body of water, a mountain to their north, and the Egyptian armies behind them. And God tells them to move forward. Have you ever felt in your life that you've been surrounded by enormous problems and there's no place for you to turn? It seems like all the bills are due, the kids aren't listening, someone's passed away in the family, and the list goes on and on and on, and there seems to be no way out. And you hear the voice of God saying, go forward. And you might think to yourself, how in the world is that going to help me, God? You want me to like walk out in the middle of the duck pond? Is that, is that what you're thinking, God? But God was waiting for the children of Israel to listen so that their backward fear would turn into forward momentum. Sometimes God calls us to impossible missions. Not to prove that we are incapable, but to prove that he is capable. 
to prove that all things are possible in Christ Jesus. In that moment, he was wanting to teach the Israelites a particular lesson that he was able. Still scratching their heads, God continues on without a breath. He continues to encourage the Israelites. You see, without God's help, there would be no way that the Israelites could do it on their own. You talk about moving millions of people across a body of water without ferries or airplanes, and you're gonna have to do it in a way that God provides for. And he doesn't just stop there. God is a God who takes it to the extreme so his glory and his grace will be proclaimed throughout the entire universe. He tells the sons of Israel in verse 15, go forward. And then he turns to Moses in verse 16 and says, as for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it and the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. And think about that for a moment. Have you uh, taken a, a stick recently and raised it up over the duck pond and see if it parted? Nobody's done that? No, just kidding. I can imagine Moses standing before the Red Sea with his staff and being like, I know I can't do this on my own. I can raise this stick all day, but if God is not with me, the waters will not part. And it's interesting how God always asks his children to do something that they're incapable of doing without his help, but completely capable of doing with his help. And there might be something today that God is asking you to do and you're thinking, there is no way in the world, God, that if I raise up that stick, that water's gonna part. And God is screaming loudly with love to you, arms open wide, saying, my grace is sufficient for you. Step out in faith. And God, a God of, I, I think, humor and fun adds something else to the mix in verse 17. It says, as for me, talking about himself, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. <laughs> you think for a moment. God tells the children of Israel to go forward, Moses to raise his staff so that the waters will part, and then God makes it interesting, adds a little a cherry on top and says, you know what? Then I'm gonna have Pharaoh and his armies chase you, and then you're gonna see how I'm gonna provide and we can be in those moments of fear and we can see the water to one side, the mountain to one side, the Egyptian army behind us. God saying, go forward. Our mentors and our providers saying, it's gonna be okay, I'm gonna walk through this with you. And then God saying, I'm gonna make your worst fear come up behind you, but you have to keep your focus on me and everything will be all right. You see, it was through Pharaoh and his army, that God would be honored. He said it himself in verse 17, I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through the chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. God not only was trying to provide for the, Egypt, or for the, the Israelites, but he was also trying to turn the hearts of the Egyptians towards him as well. So that by the example of the fearful, then fearless Israelites, all of Egypt would know that there's a God in heaven. And in our moments of weakness, maybe sometimes we should remember that it's not all about us, but that through our example and how God leads in our life, someone else might come to know him more. Go forward is the call when all seems impossible. Go forward. God says, go forward. The path is not yet opened, but when you move on in strength of faith and courage, I will make the way plain before your eyes. I am testing you by bringing you into straight places from which there is no deliverance except by my hand. God says, walk step by step in the path I mark for you. Trials 
will come, but go forward. This will give you an experience that will strengthen your faith in God and fit you for the truest surface. James said it well, count it all joy, dear brethren, when we come across various trials. God is working to provide in your life. And as the children of Israel made their advance towards the sea, patriarchs and prophets tells us that it wasn't until the first Israelite placed their foot in the water that the waters parted before them. It wasn't until they stepped out in faith that God worked the miracle in their lives. And I wanna challenge you today that God is willing to work the same miracle, if not a bigger miracle in your life, just like he did for the children of Israel. Whatever might be in front of you, whatever might be chasing from behind, God is with you and he's challenging you today to go forward. God is working in your life. He's preparing you for this work. Sometimes it's an impossible task, yes, but those are the best tasks because we trust in God and we trust in God to the work, to work the work of faith in our lives. Our Christian life might be beset by dangers, duty, Looks like it's gonna be too hard to perform. But God says, go forward. Those who defer obedience till every shadow of uncertainty disappears and there remains no risk of failure or defeat will never obey. Faith courageously urges and advance, hoping all things and believing all things. Whatever circumstances you might find yourself in today, not enough money to make it through the month, loss of a loved one, poor decisions of your children, sickness, poor health, a longing for Jesus' soon return, whatever that might be. We must be careful not to let our faith turn to fear. Because in our fear, we lose focus. But the God we serve is willing to turn our backward fear into forward momentum. I'll say that one more time. We must be careful not to let our faith turn to fear. Because in our fear, we lose our focus. But the God we serve is willing to turn our backward fear into forward momentum. God has put you in this position to go forward to step in faith and trust that he will provide for your every need. Go ahead, get your feet wet, go for a swim. See how God provides in your life. See the work of the Lord in your life today. Go forward is the reply. Go forward is the command. Go forward is the invitation into deliverance you have been longing for. The path where God leads the way may lie through the desert or the sea, but it's a safe place. Bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we again thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. And you hear our cries for deliverance and you hear our cries for help. And Lord, we offer that up to you today. And as you challenge us to go forward, help us to step in faith that we might not fear. Help us to continue in faith that we might continue our focus on you and continue our forward momentum to your kingdom. Lord, we leave our lives in your hands. Do with us what you will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.